Something I never understood about gaming journalism is the strange way it singles out certain games for being unpolished, like Assassin's Creed Unity, for example. People are having a hard time playing this game, actually. Uh, people are reporting a lot of bugs, a lot of connectivity issues, yep. a, lot of, a lot of weird things happening. People's faces looking like the moon in Majora's Mask. Yeah, Ugh. Yet it seems to ignore certain games such as Skyrim for the same, if not worse, lack of polish. 10 out of 10! For some reason, Skyrim is hailed as this beautiful standard for Western RPGs, and while it is fun, there are a number of bugs and glitches and straight-up broken aspects to it, even with its many re-releases, that heavily hinder the experience. Meanwhile, Assassin's Creed Unity, a game that arguably revolutionized the Assassin's Creed franchise, is seen as this load of unpolished garbage, despite the fact that it has one of the best stories, the best customization, the best multiplayer experience, the best character, the best gameplay, and the best free-running the franchise had seen to that point. So, allow me to take some time to defend this game and tell you why it's the best Assassin's Creed game, if you give it a chance. Firstly, when we're looking at any game, the most important part typically is the gameplay, and despite this game's world and story being excellent, the gameplay is still center stage. Nearly everything in this game got an overhaul. Because of the changes made to the gameplay, being an assassin never felt more fluid and efficient. Free running in previous games requires you to just hold down the right trigger and let the game work its magic. The upside of this is that learning to free run and traverse a map in previous games was super easy, but the downside of this is that it was a little janky at times, though not too often. It also made free running unfulfilling because you didn't have control over how you traverse the obstacles in front of you. What I mean is that you could run forwards to a wall, but you had no control over what animation you did or where you ended up after, within reason of course. Eventually they implemented a system where you could by holding the circle or B button, slide under or vault over short obstacles, however the opportunity to use these tactics were typically in scripted sequences. Another thing that the older games lacked was a sense of fluidity. Yes, you could get from point A to point B and look decent enough while doing it, but it felt more like getting from point A1 to point A2 and so on. The jumping didn't flow all the time either. Needless to say, the free running system in the older games were pretty good, but it had some issues and left some to be desired. Assassin's Creed Unity did not fix this parkour system. It revolutionized it. The free running system was overhauled with not only brand new animations, but with gameplay that completely changes the way you move and think when traversing environments. Parkour is now more interactive and fluid than ever, with one not so simple change. You can now control where you go on the Y axis. You can do this by holding down the right trigger to enter the free running mode, and just holding that will put you in a basic straightforward path, but holding X or A at the same time will allow you to move upwards, and either circle or B will allow you to descend. This change ironically gives the movement a whole new sense of verticality. In previous games, there was certainly some verticality to it, as you spent most of the game running across rooftops, but that's where my point lies. You ran across rooftops most of the time, in a straight line of sorts. Your options of getting up were either run along the side of lampposts or directly scale it head on, while getting down was either jumping from 50 feet onto another person or flipping into a haystack. In Unity, your options of scaling a building are still much the same, but the variety of animations make it a lot more enjoyable. And the biggest change is how you get down from buildings. Getting down from a high vantage point can still be done by dropping into a haystack or a body of water, or hell, you could still break your fall with another guy's back. However, with a new free running system, you can descend a building with not only more efficiency than we've ever seen in the franchise, but with more style too. For example, let's take a look at what happens when you try to descend from a tower in Assassin's Creed 2 compared to Unity. See the difference that makes? This system gives you so much more freedom and control over how you traverse the world, which is especially helpful in chase sequences as the older games would often end up with me failing due to the character jumping somewhere I hadn't intended. I could go into more detail, but the footage is sort of speaking for itself. On top of the extended freedom and efficiency in the parkour system, it's also important not to forget that fluidity is a huge thing when making traversal fun and cool. Unfortunately, fluidity was something that the older games generally lacked, and while yes you could sometimes get into a groove and feel pretty awesome, it wasn't often, and it didn't last very long either. Your flow was often interrupted by your character just halting for no reason, or getting stuck on a piece of a building, refusing to go up despite the fact the ledge is perfectly within reach, and in Unity, these problems are either not nearly as bad as they once were, or just flat out don't exist. Personally, I find the freedom and fluidity in the parkour system to be fun enough for me to just fuck around for hours on end doing nothing in particular. I know I've said the word fluid a lot in this last segment, but that's because it's so important and it's the best way to describe a traversal system of this kind. For a good comparison, let's take a look at one of my favorite titles from the past few years, Spider-Man. The traversal in this game was fucking nuts, and I'll let you take a guess why. It's because of the 
fluidity of the movement. You swing from one line to the next, and the game adapts to where you let go of your line and where you are when you shoot at the next line. It makes the movements of your character blend together, and it's so cool. Another thing that adds to traversal is that there's a sense of freedom, not only in how to get past an obstacle as we explained, but what obstacles you can get past as the game lets you climb anything. Some games like Mirror's Edge, for example, only let you climb certain portions of the world highlighted in red, which limits your ability to traverse a world as your path from point A to B is often linear. In Unity, anything can be climbed from the tallest building your eye can see to the little lamppost on the streets. This makes the gameplay of killing targets much more enjoyable as you can approach a situation from literally any angle, and it works well with the game's level design, but unfortunately we're gonna have to talk about that later. For now, let's work on the combat. The combat in this game is way cooler than it is in any other Assassin's Creed game because of its progression. It's a system that is easy to learn and semi-difficult to master. I don't want to necessarily say that it's difficult, because then I'll be invoking the Dark Souls part of your brain and I'll likely be causing a couple of flashbacks along the way. I would say it's unique, and with time, the system is much easier to use. You have your basic attacks performed by pressing square, which is much similar to the older Assassin's Creed games, but whereas the older games had combat that felt too easy or too hard, Unity strikes a great middle ground. And I think for a lot of you who haven't played the older Assassin's Creed games, I think it's important to take an in-depth look at where the combat system was before Unity in order to get a better understanding of what Unity really changed. Assassin's Creed 2. Great game, kinda shitty combat. Don't get me wrong, I don't expect a game as old as this to be completely polished, but the combat, to the core, was a little wonky. The combat system is based on attacking and countering, much like a lot of other action games these days. In the opening city of Florence, the guards are weak and as such make for easy enemies, so once you get to Venice, one of the later areas, things start to get a little different. By the time you get to Venice, the guards are trained enough to block most of your attacks, and each enemy turns into a wall that you just wail away at until he dies or his health is low enough for a counter to kill him. And some of the elite guards are even worse as they have so much health that they can take a huge beating before you can take them down. This leads to combat being more of a chore than an actual challenge or ordeal. And I think Ubisoft knew this, hence why they revamped it a little bit in Brotherhood. I guess the word revamp isn't entirely accurate, as it's not like they tweaked everything, but they made one change that completely changed the difficulty and flow of combat. Introducing Chain Killing. Chain Killing is the ability to immediately kill almost any enemy directly after killing another. Another minor thing to mention is that the counters now insta-kill. So with this system, if you were to run into a room of 10 guys for example, you would just wait to counter a single attack, then go on a rampage, ending the fight with ease. Now here are the pros with this new system. Combat has more flow and looks incredible cool. On the cons, combat is not a challenge. With this system, no effort has to be put into combat, so it ends up being a chore just like in Assassin's Creed 2. However, now it's for a bit of a different reason. Whereas Assassin's Creed 2 struggled with enemies being too beefy and too numerous, Brotherhood struggles with making them challenging at all. The only advantages that these older games have over Unity is the weapon variety. Sure, there are not as many swords in Brotherhood, but you can fight with your fists, your hidden blade, sword, a dagger, an axe, and you can even pick up enemy weapons like spears, and fuck, you could even pick up a broom. In Unity, on the other hand, you can only pick up one of the four classes of weapons, which would be the long-ranged weapons, the swords, the heavy weapons, and the guns. All of these classes follow the same animations too, so when it comes to weapon variety, you could argue that both games have variety, though I think Brotherhood edges ahead in this case. Well, combat now is more similar to Assassin's Creed 2, however now it's more gear-based. Sure, stronger enemies are only harder due to their health and their damage output, but you can solve that by upgrading your own weapons and armor. I like this system a lot, because not only does it add a metric shit ton of customization, which the series has been lacking up to this point, but it also makes progression more noticeable. Granted, there are a few issues that arise from this, such as cooler gear being locked behind tedious missions or collectibles. For example, if you're going to be an assassin, chances are your two primary colors of choice would be either white or black. The game gives you white, thank god, but if you want black, you have to spend what took me about 4 hours gathering 100 collectibles. What is the point of that? Most people wouldn't have that many collectibles by the end game anyways. It just feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. I think it would be better if all the gear was locked behind an in-game paywall. Some gear is like this, for example, some of the legendary gear you can get will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I like this, because when you start the game, you'll be making maybe a couple thousand for missions and side missions, Though as those missions get harder, you'll earn more money, so in that sense there is a good progression. Eventually you'll be able to afford expensive gear like it's nothing. The gear you choose also has different stats to go along with it, like melee, which allows you to do more damage in one-on-one -on -one combat, health, which gives you more health, stealth, which makes you harder to detect, and ranged, which makes projectiles stronger and ammo more abundant. Other effects are set too, like extra revive speed and so on. Weapons have stats like these too, but I don't think I need to go into it. The point is, the game gives you a ton of freedom to play the way you want. So in short, there wasn't a whole lot that Unity changed combat-wise to the system, aside from polishing it a little more and making the progression of the combat smoother and more rewarding. Or if you don't like combat, you can use the age-old trick of throwing down a smoke bomb and getting some free hits in. 
course, there are also ranged weapons like the Phantom Blade, which is essentially just shooting a blade out of your wrist, or a pistol, but they also brought back things like the Berserk Blade, which has maddening poison on it, which drives its targets into a rage, allowing for easy work of guards in your way, or a good distraction. They also have smoke bombs and other lures, but nothing in this sense was made better or worse throughout the franchise, so I'll leave it at that. I think the biggest issue with the previous game's combat is not the fact that it was hard or that you could be easily overwhelmed by four guards, is that there was no stealth system. Assassin's Creed 2, from my assumptions, puts all these enemies lying around because they want you to take a more quiet and assassin-like approach, but the game has no way to achieve that other than some throwing knives. I mean, look at some of the full synchronization requirements in Brotherhood. Full synchronization, for those of you who don't know, is when you complete a mission while doing an extra requirement, such as infiltrating a castle. Get in, and you'll get 50% synchronization. <clears throat> get in without being spotted, and you'll earn a full 100%. The lack of a stealth system really becomes an issue in these missions, because there's no way to sneak around, and you have to rely on throwing knives and guns. In Unity, there's an actual stealth mode that can be entered by pressing the L2 button, leading you to crouch and move quieter. And this mode you can't be detected as easily. And on top of that, you get to use a cover system, which is a lifesaver. This system makes getting the job done so much more efficient and satisfying. Another helpful tool is your Eagle Vision, which highlights important things like enemies, interactable objects, and other important things. This system hasn't been changed at all through the franchise, as far as I know, so there isn't much to say here other than it's a useful tool. Now, a lot of what I've talked about thus far has been the core gameplay and the mechanics it's based on. However, I think it's important to look at how these mechanics are used in the missions within the game. In Brotherhood, a lot of the missions were very linear. You had to tail a guard and eavesdrop on his conversation, kill a couple guards, and take down your target. The issue is that the way you got to your target was stilted. You got in through an open window and essentially nothing else. Granted, the weapon you use is up to you, but it pales in comparison to Unity. Unity's mission still still involve the normal eavesdropping and tailing every now and then, but many more missions really take advantage of the sandbox at hand, allowing you to interact with the world in order to get to you and execute your target. I think the best way to describe how well this is done is to just show you one of the missions. One of the first targets you get to assassinate is located at the meticulously crafted Notre Dame, however getting in will be a bit of a task. Thankfully, you have a few options. Firstly, you know that the man you're going to be assassinating will be meeting with another man in a confessionary, so you can assassinate that guy who's supposed to be there and take his place. You can also obtain some keys from high-profile guards, making it much easier to get in. There are a few different ways to get in, such as using the underground tunnels, or maybe using your key to get through the locked door on the roof, or maybe you'd just like to sneak in through an open window. Once inside, your options of taking out the target are just as varied. You could of course take the gun's blazing route, however at this level it might be a little too dangerous. Maybe you want to take him out from afar, or jump down from the higher floors to finish the job. Maybe you want to take the opportunity from earlier and sit in the confessionary, listen to some of his plans, and then... There are also short missions where you get transported to a different time in Paris, which is super cool. And while these missions don't affect the story and could have easily been cut out, they're so cool and don't happen enough to make an intrusion, so overall, these missions are also really sick. Bottom line, the open level design on top of the exceptional gameplay mechanics make this one of the best in the series when it comes to this category. However, a big part of the style that this game radiates is due to the animations. Of course, with the Assassin's Creed games, the animations were generally pretty good. Granted, back in the first game, the animations were a little janky and whatnot, but they really nailed it in Assassin's Creed 2, to the point where the animations in that game were used again and again over the next handful of games, and even in Assassin's Creed 4. The animations in these games felt nice and reasonable, and they all had this superhuman feeling to it. Of course, Ezio and Connor were not clearing buildings in a single bound, but they were vertically leaping up a wall to a point higher than their own body. So while it may not have been incredibly realistic, it was much more fun to do that rather than be limited by the world's design which in the case of nearly all of these games, had to be accurate to the time period. The animations within Unity, however, have been completely overhauled as your character now leaps off of buildings with incredible force and weight in contrast to the earlier games that made you feel as light as one of those hundred feathers you had to collect. When he hit the ground, Arno is staggered and you can see the weight of his body really pulling him down as he scrambles to his feet for the next jump. It is true that in this game you can still leap an incredible vertical distance, however these animations feel like they have weight to them. I mean, in some cases Arno will legitimately dive to make a jump and it looks so cool every time. The climbing animations have an incredible amount of finesse added to them as well, which is one of the biggest changes to the animations. There's a brand new sense of style and fashion that goes with these animations while still being functional. And yes, some animations such as this one here feel a little janky, it's still far better than the other animations in the series. And the animation itself isn't enough to pull you out of the world, or make exploring not fun. There is also a good enough variety of animations, meaning that you won't see the same animation back to back too often like in previous games. Though, with all the buildings and trees you'll be jumping from by the end of the campaign, you'll know a lot of these animations inside out. The movement in general is a huge reason why Unity is so appealing to me, as it looks great with its finesse, and this finesse extends to the combat animations. The different animations for the sword swings, counters, and clashes make fighting a real treat in a game series where it was a lot of the same animations and a lot of chain killing. The different animations for the swords, ranging from attacks to even the drawing of the sword from your belt, all 
look great with a slick sense of veteranism to it. When comparing these animations to older games, they stack up relatively well, with Unity making some general improvements where needed, such as the variety of finishing moves. These moves all look great, with my favorite being these few. The different tactical options such as the guard breaking push that sees Arno throw his weight into the enemy allowing him to get a hit in, or even the basic counter animations look stylish and have great impact. Finally, the assassination kills look as great as they always have, and as usual have a ton of weight to them. Now to be fair, the animations of previous games were just as good, and the first to come to mind is Assassin's Creed 3, as its animations were just as well made, and the kill animations in particular were like something out of an action movie. Though some people wouldn't like these kill animations, as they can come across as a little over the top, but in this particular area for me, I find the comparison would just be a toss-up. They both have their upsides and downsides, however a big thing to keep in mind is that generally speaking, the animations throughout the games leading up to Unity have been reused and all feel quite samey. This is where Unity shines, as all the animations animations are absolutely new, which in my opinion, gives it the edge over previous games. As far as miscellaneous animations go, characters on the street look generally pretty good, and things such as Arno's clothes, specifically his robes, bustling in the wind as he leaps from building to building look spectacular. There's even detail in things such as Arno's little smirk whenever he's twirling his sword around. Finally, the cutscenes in this game look spectacular, with facial movements and facial designs in general looking top notch and doing a great job of not leaning into the uncanny valley that we see so often these days. Granted, cutscenes in previous games have looked just as good. The characters all look great, and the cutscenes in general look polished, except for this frequent glitch that makes all the physics-based materials, such as Arno's hair or coat, fly up in the wind for a few frames. This, however, doesn't last so long as to distract you, but it is there long enough to notice. I don't know much about cutscenes or movies in general from a critical standpoint, but I can at least show you some of these cutscenes, and they pretty well speak for themselves. Something that I think is a huge asset in this game is the open world. After all, you'll be spending the next 50 odd hours in there. The architecture of Paris and Versailles is flat out wild. The amount of detail on all the buildings and the streets make the world mind-blowing the first time you see it. Granted, every Assassin's Creed game has had impeccable world design, so Unity isn't really revolutionizing anything. I don't want to talk too much about the map as you've been looking at it quite a lot by this point, so I think I'll leave it at that. Finally, a huge thing that Assassin's Creed Unity added for the first and as of this video last time is online co-op. You and up to four people can not only free roam across all of Paris, but you can also do some specific co-op missions. Now you might be thinking that this sounds awesome, and it really does, however this is definitely one of the downsides of the game. And this is because most of the missions are barely playable due to the lag or they just straight up don't work at all. For example, I tried to do this mission and it would only let you progress when all players were in the area. And this one guy just looked like he stopped playing and we had to wait upwards of 10 minutes before he eventually picked up his controller and we got to carry on with the mission. This mission eventually led us to an arena, but the enemies that were supposed to be in the arena ended up being invisible, and people just kinda died for no reason, and on top of that, there were bugs out the ass, and my god it was a disaster. Another issue with these co-op missions is that they don't scale with how many players are there, so there are plenty of missions that are brutally difficult and time-consuming just because it expects you to be playing with 3 or 4 people. So you might think, oh whatever Aqua, just don't play these harder missions, who cares? Well. I care, because weapons and armor are locked behind these missions, and not just one, but three pieces of gear are locked behind each mission, and you can only receive one of these pieces of gear per playthrough of the mission. So in order to get a certain piece of gear that would totally complete your outfit, you'd have to play through a mission up to three times before you get it. This can take upwards of an hour and a half, and it just leaves me scratching my head. I understand if you want to lock a piece of gear behind a mission, but why three? The system could have worked better if instead of having to play the mission multiple times, you could have a bonus requirement such as don't use a smoke bomb in order to get those extra pieces. Now I think up to this point, you've likely noticed that I've been ignoring the elephant in the room. The biggest issue that people have with this game is the bugs. I just want to say, this game is not as bad as everyone says. I have plenty of friends who have played this game, and I myself have played the game on launch, and I even played through it multiple times since then, and in my personal experience, the bugs that the game is quote unquote stuffed full of are not as present as some articles may lead you to believe. In my experience, I saw one major bug and a few minor bugs. The one major bug was where the side of a building wasn't loaded in and when I tried to enter it I fell through the world, though that was a couple years ago so I don't have footage of it, and any other minor bugs were the odd animation bug. The first thing people think of when I mention bugs are the infamous missing face bug. However, I'm curious how many people have actually seen this bug, and any others for that matter. I made a reddit post to try and get a decent sample size and here are the results. Generally speaking, a lot of people did not experience major bugs within the game. One person said that they played Unity roughly one year after release and didn't experience a single bug. Some people did say that they found issues with Arno getting stuck in the air, or having weird animation bugs, but nothing that was able to ruin the experience. I'll leave a link to this reddit post down below so you can see for yourself what people have said. Another big complaint that people have is the frame rate, and I agree, the frame rate can get very bogged down at times, but it wasn't enough to ruin the fun. I am of course coming from a place of bias, so if the footage 
footage on screen right now looks too choppy, then by all means, feel free to disagree. I really want to emphasize that too. This is just my opinion, and you will likely have a different opinion, and I totally respect that. I'm just making this video because when I was talking with a lot of people at work, they all assumed Unity was a dumpster fire, even though they hadn't played the game. And I explained to them that it's not as bad as people make it seem. I thought it might be a decent idea to put all these ideas into a video. I also know that this is an awkward point to say this, but I want to emphasize that this is all subjective, and I say that because the story and the characters in this game is possibly the most subjective part of this video. So with that being said, let's talk about the story and the characters. The story surrounds our main character Arno Dorian, who had his father killed as a child and was adopted by the father of his lifelong love interest, Elise de la Serre. Years later, as an adult, Arno stays at Mr. de la Serre's home in Versailles, while Elise is out doing other stuff, I guess. Until one day, Arno is ordered to deliver a crucially important letter to Mr. de la Serre before he reaches a banquet of sorts. But due to Elise coming to town, Arno slips it under his office door instead and heads out to the party that Elise will be attending. After sharing a romantic moment with Elise, Arno jumps out the window to see Mr. de la Serre dead on the floor, while a man calls the guards, assuming assuming Arno is responsible. He then gets captured and wakes up in the legendary prison, the Bastille. In there, he meets a man named Belloc, who as it turns out, knew Arno's father, and after seeing that Arno has eagle vision, offers to train him. After a few months of training in the Bastille, it eventually comes under attack, giving an opportunity for Arno and Belloc to escape. Before they part ways, however, Belloc offers a position as an assassin to Arno, and they both leap off the Bastille into the waters below. Once out of prison, he meets with Elise, who tells him that the letter Arno was supposed to deliver to Mr. de la Serre was in fact warning of his assassination, meaning that Arno played an involuntary direct role in the death of his father, or pseudo-father. With nowhere to turn, Arno decides to seek out the Brotherhood for help in killing those who conspired against his father, and upon meeting with Belek and completing his initiation, he eventually gets the opportunity to assassinate Suver, a high-ranking Templar who played a hand in the death of Mr. de la Serre. Upon killing Suver, we find out that when Arno assassinates someone, he sees their memories. Arno then gains info that Suver was working with a man named Roy de Thunes. I think that's- I think I'm saying that right, I might be fucking it up, I'm not French. And Arno begins chasing after him and finds out his location through the help of a Templar higher-up named Latouche. Along the way, Arno makes friends with Marquis de Sade, who advises Arno on the best way to find his target, and upon killing Roy, he gives Arno a Templar weapon that he found, and told him that a blacksmith named Germain crafted it. Bringing it back to the Brotherhood, they give Arno the okay to investigate. Arno tracks down Germain and finds out that a man named Lafreniere was a man who ordered the weapon, and upon tracking him down, Arno kills him. When he informs the Brotherhood that he killed him without permission, mission, he gets scolded, though they decide to allow Arno to continue his investigation. After eavesdropping on a Templar meeting, we find out that Elise is going to be ambushed by them. We save Elise and unfortunately, she's not very quick to trust Arno as he's an assassin and she's a Templar. Though her loyalty to the Templar Order after their assassination of her father, and now attempted assassination of herself, is being questioned. We eventually convince her to turn to the Brotherhood for help, and despite the fact that Arno literally brought a Templar to the assassin hideout, they seem pretty okay with it. Arno's told that the Germain case should be left to a more skilled assassin, though Arno plans to ignore this advice. After being denied assistance on reasonable grounds, Elise and Arno leave, and begin to discuss the investigation of her father's killer, and when Arno mentions Germain, Elise tells him that Germain was actually exiled from the Templar Order, and upon investigating his home, they find that he was not only the one who killed her father, but is also planning a New Age Templar Order. Arno and Elise decide that they should inform the Brotherhood's supreme leader, Mirabeau but he's been assassinated in his own home, with all evidence pointing to Elise. However, it couldn't have been her, she was with us the whole time. After a wild goose chase, tracking down leads and clues, we come face to face with Mirabeau's killer. Took you long enough, piss pot. Belek. Should've known it'd be you that'd find me. Only question is, what happens now? Belek attempts to get Arno to join his cause of purging the Assassin Order in order to reform the Brotherhood. Arno declines, and after a really neat boss fight, we strike Belek down, and Arno is tasked by the Brotherhood to track down letters that Mirabeau sent to the King of France. When he gets there, he runs into Napoleon, who tells him of a military leader who is a Templar named Riel, who is directly connected to Germain, and upon assassinating him, we see that he was in talks with Marie Levesque, with a plan to starve France in order to start a riot and dethrone the King. Arno kills her and finds out that Germain will be at the public execution of the king. Upon heading there, Germain surrounds Arno, and while Germain is escaping, Elise tells him to go after him while she deals with the guards, but Arno refuses to put her in that much danger. After Germain gets away, Elise questions Arno's devotion to avenging her father, and cuts ties with him. Arno, seeking guidance, goes back to the Brotherhood's hideout, but is stopped by two of his fellow assassins, being taken to the council, which ultimately decides that due to his constant neglect of the assassin code, he will be exiled from the Brotherhood. Arno then goes back to Versailles, where he falls into a deep depression and leads him looking for answers in the bottom of the bottle, until one night he wakes up from a nasty hangover and has to go on a hunt for his dad's watch, the last thing he has from his father. During this time, we see some real badass moments from Arno that give off some Batman energy, and I, I love it. Where? The palace! They're at the palace! 
Thank you. Eventually, Lee shows up and has the watch, and after giving Arno a pep talk, they decide they'll go take down Germain without the Brotherhood, but before that, he has a loose end he wants to tie assassinating Latouche. After that's finished, he heads back to Paris in order to find Germain's right-hand man, Robespierre, but he's heavily guarded. In order to make him vulnerable, they plant incriminating evidence against him on a few people, allowing them to turn against Robespierre, and in turn, Germain cuts him off. Now that he's vulnerable, Arno and Elise infiltrate his office to interrogate him, and it's one of my favorite scenes in the game. I sent for Zemma hours ago. Gemma warned me about you. You're one of them, aren't you? An assassin. Not anymore. Where's Germain? Elise. We don't have much time. Where is Germain? I will never talk. <laughs> then right. <laughs> the temple. I should have known. I hope you enjoy revolutionary justice, monsieur. <laughs> After figuring out Germain's location at the temple, Arno confronts him at the top of the temple, where we see that he's using the Sword of Eden, an all-powerful artifact which gives him the upper hand and allows him to escape into the temple depths. Once down the catacombs to give chase, Elise catches up with us, and they tag-team it up to take him down. Though eventually, through the use of the artifact, Germain causes a pillar to fall on Arno. Elise, instead of helping Arno, decides to try and take down Germain herself, but ultimately, Arno knows she won't be able to make it. In a burst of strength, Arno lifts the pillar and runs towards Germain, but the sword explodes, killing Elise and severely wounding Germain. In a bit sweet moment, Arno slowly inserts his blade into Germain's throat. In his memories, Germain explains to Arno that he was a sage, one of the only people in the world destined to wield an artifact of Eden, and talks about his struggles of living up to his destiny. But before we find out more, he passes, leading this wild goose chase to an end. In an epilogue, Arno reflects on the Assassin Code, and realizes that the phrase, everything is permitted, is not a rite of passage, but in fact a warning that nothing is off limits for him and his enemies. Our final scene is Arno entering the catacombs to seal the Templar vault. While the story may not have been spectacular, it certainly is my favorite, and I believe Arno is the best character in any Assassin's Creed game, and Elise is my favorite supporting character, for sure. Firstly, Arno isn't special. Sure, he has eagle vision and has training to properly assassinate his targets, but I mean, he's not an extraordinary human. The entire purpose for exploring his memories is not because he himself is special, but because he came into contact with someone who is. For comparison, Ezio in all of his installments was portrayed as his prophet. People literally told him he was the chosen one, and his involvement with the artifacts of Eden made him seem like a superhuman, and it seemed like nothing was a threat. Which, mind you, isn't a bad thing, but it's refreshing to see a main character that's kind of a delinquent. Arno messes up from start to finish, and the plot is directly influenced by his own bad decisions. The main quest of the story, which is to avenge Mr. de la Serre, is directly caused by Arno's negligence. Ezio never messes up. He just fixes other people's mistakes. The best way to explain this comparison is the idea of Arno and Ezio's family. Ezio's family dies due to Templars conspiring against them. Arno's father dies because he neglected to deliver a letter to him. His actions even get him expelled from the Brotherhood, and the Brotherhood is actually another great aspect of the story. They actually have a Brotherhood of Paris, and they explore their ideals. In any Assassin's Creed game, the Brotherhood consisted of a few people, and their initiation and inner workings were not really expanded upon. In Unity, the Creed not only has an actual hideout, but it also has more members. People pop the place and the Creed has rules, and if you don't follow them, you get kicked out. The Creed is always in talks with the King, and always has people collecting intel, and all this makes the story and the idea of the Brotherhood of Paris so much more entertaining and engaging. I think the fact that Arno isn't perfect, and that he makes mistakes and learns from those mistakes, makes him so much more of a likable character, and his charisma and one-liners really add to the enjoyability. Let's get your arse in position. The last questions, piss pop. I live to serve. Arno's arc isn't perfect, as he has highs and lows, such as in the final moments. For comparison's sake, Ezio at the end of Assassin's Creed 2 decides not to kill the man who ordered for his family's death and the deaths of hundreds of others. This is because his story was driven by vengeance, and by the time he makes it to him, he decides that's not worth it, and decides to let him live on and let go of his revenge. Arno, on the other hand, completely gives in. He kills Germain, and he does it with a slow, relieving fashion, as if a weight has just been lifted off his shoulders. And I like that. I feel like I would do the same if I was in his position. You know, 
assuming I already killed like a thousand people up to that point. Ezio also doesn't have a love interest, or at least not a very good one. Katarina was in the game for like 15 minutes and that was it. And if we're being honest, none of the assassins really do, or at least they don't have anything compared to Arno and Elise. They have a connection from the very first moment, and they eventually become such a great duo, and because of this, her death is so much more impactful. One of my favorite moments was when Arno and Elise had to escape from some guards and decided to get away in a hot air balloon. But Arno couldn't get to the balloon in time, so he has to chase after the hot air balloon during a storm while avoiding guards. And when he catches up, he shares a wholesome moment with Elise. It was nice. The story is ultimately a wild goose chase, but it's a good one. The supporting characters like Elise and Balek really help to make the story interesting and entertaining, even on the third playthrough now. And those are really all the reasons why Unity is the best Assassin's Creed game in the franchise, in my opinion. And if you disagree with any of my points, please let me know in the comments. I'm entirely open to discussion and having my mind changed. As far as a closing statement, I think Unity has gotten the shaft a little bit and was treated unfairly based on bugs that were not as common as people made it out to be. Don't get me wrong, the game lacks polish, but it's nowhere near as bad as games like Skyrim or even, as a modern day example, Jedi Fallen Order which I may or may not get into in a separate video. I want to clarify that I don't think critics have a vendetta against Unity or anything like that. I think, honestly, it was just a coincidence that took off. The missing face meme likely boosted and further enforced this idea of Unity being a broken game, but I hope I could change your mind on it a little bit, and maybe you could pick it up. Especially considering the game is super cheap now and the DLC expansion is free because Ubisoft wanted to say sorry for releasing such a buggy game. So as much as it's cliche to say, I don't think Unity is a bad game. I think it's just severely misunderstood. Hi friends, thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. I know this one was uh, quite long. Uh, I just wanted to make a few closing statements, the most important of which being, uh, in, in this video it kind of comes across as if I don't like the previous Assassin's Creed games, and that is entirely not true. In fact, I just bought the Ezio collection and Assassin's Creed 3 and Assassin's Creed Liberation Remastered on PlayStation 4 like a month before this video was made and I was actually playing these games in tandem with Unity while I was making this video. So I don't want you to think that I hate those games because I don't. I think they're really good. I do think that they have that Ubisoft feel to them of certain things just being a little wonky, but I think it's really they're really charming games and they're really good. Um, I also want to say that you can follow me on Twitch where I, uh, I stream pretty pretty regularly right now. As of this video, I'm doing a Pokemon Sword and Shield playthrough. I'm a little late to the buzzer on that one, but... Oh, look who came out to play. You're just too cool to hang out with your friends, huh? What the fuck? Do that again. Yeah, so come check that out. I also have uh, other video essays that you can check out in the description. I also have highlight videos that you can check out in the description. And another link in the description will be to Nam12399's channel. Um, a lot of you guys know who he is, but if you don't, he makes video essays that are really good. Specifically, his uh, Persona 3 FES video that he made is not only really long, but it's really good. So go check that out. Check out his channel for more video essays and check out the playlist below for more of my video essays. And I will see you guys next time. Thanks so much for uh, making it to the end of this uh, this endeavor and i'll uh i'll see you guys next time uh next video i would say is probably going to be the two that i'm up in the air on right now are spider-man ps4 which i'll probably be praising a lot or it'll be jedi fallen order which i'll be praising a lot but also shitting on a little bit so i don't know play by ear i love you guys i'll see you guys in the next video bye